Hi, Jim Vanoski with Manufacturing Talks here. You know, one of my favorite public policy outfits is right here in Michigan. It's called the Mackinac Center for Public Policy. And one of my least favorite things going on, really, in my whole career and, and in the political world is handouts to manufacturers, subsidies for people in my world. I don't think they're right. And we're going to talk about that today because we've got James Homan from the Mackinac Center. He is... Uh, writing extensively about that very thing. He's going to talk to us about uh, the realities of those kinds of business, business subsidies. So stay tuned. Welcome to Manufacturing Talks with Jim Vanosky. Industry has a million cool stories, and Jim talks to the movers and shakers who are making them happen. Let's dive in. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Manufacturing Talks. I'm Jim Vanoski, your host, and I'm glad to be joined by James Homan today. He is Director of Fiscal Policy at the Mackinac Center for Public Policy. Welcome, James. Hello, Jim. Glad to have you on today. I think we're going to be talking about something that's pretty important here. Um, you know, it just seems like I, I watch the headlines and there's more and more public money being doled out to manufacturers and it kind of sticks in my craw and you're here to help me Explain why that's not such a great thing, right? Yeah, I, I hope so. Uh, I mean, this has been something I've been doing for a while, and I, I hope I've got an effective me and persuasive message. Although it seems like sometimes it's not all that persuasive because every state seems to just keep adding more subsidy programs. Well, and we will dive into that. Before we do, why don't you just tell us a little about yourself, your background, how you got doing what you're doing there at the Mackinac Center? Yeah, so... Uh, um, I got to be honest, this is my uh, first and only professional job. I've been doing this uh, research and writing about fiscal policy facing the state of Michigan since I was 18 years old. Wow. Started off as nice. a volunteer here uh, and, and kind of worked, uh, worked my way into this. But it's really a unique kind of job. It's a free market think tank. You know, we have principles and we try to apply them to reform form the, uh, Michigan's government and to try and find interesting things to move the public debate. And on this issue, on the question of selective business subsidies, our most important role is just to speak truth to power. Of, uh, there's a lot of important and politically powerful people who want special favors and make it seem like it's the smartest thing in the world to give them taxpayer cash. And the, uh, and they sell it as an economic development program. Mm -hmm. And in time and time again, these things don't develop the economy. They waste taxpayer money. It's ineffective at creating jobs. It's uh, expensive to the state budget, and it's unfair to other businesses. And part of my job is just to try and uh, shout that uh, from as many mountaintops as I can. So thank you for having me on to get to broadcast this message yet again. Glad to do it. Uh, I've spent my whole career in manufacturing and, you know, I can certainly see the emotional argument, right? We, we've watched manufacturing get hollowed out in America. And so it's tough to compete. Wait, and say hey, we can let throw me, public money at it and bring it back, right? Yeah. Well, let me contest that. <laughs> America is producing more stuff than ever. Manufacturing uh, 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 production is up. It's yep. just done with fewer people. So it yep. does feel like we're, produce, uh, we're producing less, but we are producing more. America's on the cutting edge of so many different industries. Uh, manufacturing is up. Like It's just this myth that we don't produce things anymore. Yep. Uh, we do produce a lot of stuff, more than we ever have before, just with fewer people. Yeah. And, and honestly, the, the people numbers have been going up in recent years as well. So we're not even losing people yeah. like we were there for that stretch, what, between like the 70s and two, early 2000s? Yeah, I think I, I, I was looking at some of those numbers is that it is coming up. I mean, uh, which is good too. I like, I'm mm -hmm. happy. Every, uh, any industry that is growing feels very different from an industry that's shedding jobs. Yep. Um, but yeah, manufacturing is a huge part of the economy. It's a huge part of the state of Michigan. And it is underappreciated just how much we manufacture. Yeah. Well, so when we look at this subsidy uh, discussion, you can certainly see the obvious draw for a politician, right? You get the headline that you're providing support to our hardworking manufacturers. There's no loss there to the public policy person who gets that going. But I've seen more and more people in my world in manufacturing 
advocates who are cheering these handouts and just these lavish subsidies um, that have become so prevalent here in Michigan, much less other states. So what do you say to people in my world who make that argument that, yeah, it's good for, for our business? Well, it probably is good for your business. It, it's usually uh, 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 handing out taxpayer cash, uh, tax, uh, special tax breaks that other people don't get, preferred loans, uh, and, and, and grants. Like, tens, ten, like everyone wants free money. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, it is probably good for individual businesses. But the, the point of an economic development program, as these things are, are built at least, is to develop the economy. And they don't do that. They're ineffective at creating jobs. They're expensive to the state budget. And they're unfair to the businesses. You don't get them. As I said before, I got, I'll probably repeat that a number of times just because I think it's an important point to drive yeah. home. And that's not an ideological point. Those are empirical claims. Like right. it, it's this isn't me saying it's like uh, economists have used clever methods to isolate the effects of politicians' attempts to create jobs with special subsidies. And, or tax breaks too, and again, uh, preferred loans and on all sorts of other uh, uh, other economic assistance that state governments mm. hand out on a select basis. And what they, um, to just summarize the literature on this issue is that sometimes there are positive effects. Like I, I wish, that I wish it would be easier if, in my case if, if no study ever found that there were positive effects. Yeah. But most of them do find negative effects. But the important thing and the important thing for public policy and the important thing to drive home uh, from from the literature is that none of them produce large effects. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, uh, politicians think that they're landing the future for their state economies by subsidizing the, the right firms or landing an Amazon or a Foxconn or these big companies that that have that make headline job claims. That yep. that we, we got this and now we're uh, uh, we have secured our, our, our economic future. And no one ever finds that. The select, uh, these selective subsidies just do not produce that result. And actually, I'm uh, I'm working on, on on something for the state of Michigan where our lawmakers are talking about adding another subsidy program because why not? I mean, we already have a program that uh, that allows the state government to give whatever business they want, however much business or however much money they want to give them mm -hmm. uh, with the only restriction being that it has to be appropriated by the state legislature and approved by an appropriations committee, which yep. is uh, like, like that's a program that we have. It seems like that's enough. If you've like that, no one else has a program like this um, uh, that should be enough to, to hand out as much money to, to whoever you want. Uh, but they want to add another program anyway. And what I'm going to try and argue, uh, at least to legislators, is that, I, like, I know I'm persuaded that these things are bad ideas, but I know that the supporters really want them. Uh, so let's try and meet in the middle uh, on this and, and say that uh, let's try and add performance targets to these right. subsidy programs. Right. That is, if they are an economic development program, they need to develop the economy. That means, and, and for these ones, especially politicians are, are, or our elected uh, officials are looking for job growth. And so, okay, right. let's let's take Michigan's economic performance. It's a trajectory that we're on right now, or, or you know, we, we don't have to get too sophisticated, but you're saying that this program is going to increase that number. So the total number of jobs here in the state of Michigan, tell me how much and, and be able to directly attribute it to the companies who get your specialized or who, who get you know, assistance from this program. Yeah. Because I think that if you tried to do that exercise, calling it out on this economic development program to have measurable impacts on the state's economic performance, then the jig is up. They're not going yeah. to do that because they don't yep. do that. We have uh, we have decades of history on this that they um, that while it seems and while the, the, their sponsors pledge that they're going to have a material impact on the state economy, they just don't. Um, so so that's kind of where I'm 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 going to try and pitch. We'll see how that yeah. goes. <laughs> well, and that's it's nothing complicated either, right? You you have a commitment that you're going to deliver this economic benefit, and if you don't, then you give at least a portion of that money back, and yet yeah. you almost well, never see that. Yeah, so I would like, I would like it if the performance target was we're you're, we're going to produce this economic benefit by this date, and if we don't do that, we stop handing out new awards. 
backwards. Right. Uh, like, yeah. like that, that would be my, my dream goal because there would be an economic development program that did not live up to its economic outcomes. Uh, and, but I, I mean, we'll see how that goes. Uh, I hope it's tempting to legislators uh, as they're considering these programs, because I do think that some of them really do think like buy into the hype. They really do think that, yeah. uh, that these things are economically important and that they're beneficial to this, to the state, uh, to the state. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 I will, uh, like, I think differently, but that's okay too. Let's, can we agree on, on this performance uh, or on this performance outcome? Uh, we'll see how that goes. I, uh, I don't, uh, I'm not optimistic about it, especially because when you look at the economic assessments from our economic development administrators, they're completely self-serving. Yeah. So in, in the state of Michigan, we have a tourism program called Pure Michigan. You've probably seen the ads with the, the Tim yep. Allen voiceover, although I'm not sure he's still doing that, yep. but, um, uh, they're nice ads. Uh, the people, I don't like that they're taxpayer financed. It's like, look, if you're going to benefit an industry, have the people in the industry get together and pay for right. a tourism campaign, leave taxpayers out of this. Uh, but, you know, some legislators think that it's a wise investment of public dollars. And the administrators, though, say that there are huge returns to the state treasury for this program. For every dollar you spend on Pure Michigan, it returns seven dollars uh, in tax revenue to uh, to the state. And um, and you know multiple times that to the state economy, and and we're like, well, how'd you come up with that? And it's like, well, we put some numbers into a black box model, and, <laughs> and out they came. It's like, okay, yep. what numbers did you put in that black box model? Because did you account for costs? And we uh, and the state has been uh, has has mentioned repeatedly that like, no, we're not going to tell you. Uh, we're not, uh, this is a, we used a contractor. We're not sharing that. We've actually sued the state to try and get those numbers mm -hmm. because our economic development administrators are not interested, or at least ostensibly don't seem to be interested in justifying their programs, their claims. They're interested in getting more money to play with and, and, uh, and announcing their success. Yep. So, it's frustrating thing uh, to see. I don't. I really don't like that, especially on on those. Like, it is okay for politicians to bolster, as or to bluster. Bluster. That's the right word. Yeah. Uh, as in to to tell to say how great of a thing there is, and they're accountable to voters. And if uh, voters don't like their bluster, they can vote them out of office. You can't do that for economic administrators. Economic right. growth. Our, our administrators are supposed to be public servants. And I don't like it when they mislead the public. That fundamentally offends me, and it ought to offend other other voters too. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's just one of my many gripes. Uh, well, that that whole notion of the cost benefit analysis is one that just seems to be farther and farther away from anything we ever talk about when it comes to to public policy. But you're right; anything we do that's supposed to be an investment should be paying a dividend should be giving a return. And as, as the Mackinac Center's our, work has shown that that's so rarely the case. Yeah. And to have our, um, to be held to high standards and to be able to justify their expenditures at these high standards. But yeah. this is, I mean, this is a general problem that you get with public policy, not just in economic development policy, but in education and in, in environmental protection and uh, job training issues. Oh, I mean, all sorts of, food, which is that our lawmakers want to be judged based on inputs, not outputs. Yeah. As in, you should vote for me because I gave money to politically favorable people, not that I produce these important public benefits. Yeah. And I yeah. think that's something that people should notice more and should hold their lawmakers to higher standards. Because when you listen to the claims that are being uh, that our elected officials make, and this is not an especially partisan. Uh, a partisan tendency either. No. It is, um, uh, it's look at all of these inputs I have secured, not look at all of these important outcomes I have accomplished. Right. Yeah. And you're right. It's not partisan. I mean, here in Michigan, we can pick on the Democrats who are in, in power today and uh, had been in the past, but over in Wisconsin, you mentioned Foxconn. That was a Republican administration that foisted that debacle on the folks over there. Yeah, so this issue it has some interesting uh, uh, partisan angles to it. Uh, it is not like 
blue states and red states both offer selective subsidies to big firms. Uh, like that's it, it, that's that happens everywhere. But there's also a cross ideological opposition to this. So, you know, uh, uh, you know, we're a free market think tank. We uh, I wish we would uh, our appeals would uh, would have would be broad and that everyone would would like uh, uh, what we say. Uh, yep. But we, we tend to appeal more to people on the right. Well, we've got friends who are on the left who are great on this issue. Uh, and, and what is interesting about the issue of handing out selective business subsidies is that a lot of times the people on the right and the left, on the left, they can come together, but they come together on issues for different reasons. So, for instance, I, um, we're part of a coalition of people who are trying to loosen the state's occupational licensing rules so right. that they're less yeah. of a bur uh, barrier to entry, and you know, and, and uh, ensure that that where they exist, they are securing uh, public health benefits. Uh, there are some people on the left who 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 want to do that too, but for the most part, right. like a, a lot of them are like, well, this helps prisoners get, uh, or sorry, uh, uh, for um, uh, uh, you know people out of prison that uh, this tends to be like a barrier to entry for them. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to be more, and it's like that's a good idea too. I can support it. But that's not necessarily my primary uh, motive uh, motive on this policy. On business subsidies, we hate them for the exact same reason. It's like uh, uh, government just shouldn't be handing out special favors. Mm -hmm. um, I think some of the um, some of the explanation for why our lawmakers keep doing this might be a little bit different, but but we it's it's not an issue where people on the right and the left like when they when they dig into this one disagree or disagree for different reasons. We we don't we both see them as ineffective, expensive, and unfair. Yep. Yep. Well, and to that end, the Mackinac Center did some excellent work that I came across back when the whole latest battery plant proposal was being discussed, the, the uh, Whitmer administration and Ford, you know, handing money to mm -hmm. our Chinese friends to put a yeah. battery plant up there near... Uh, big Rapids, yeah. Yeah, Big Rapids. And, and I had no idea, I wasn't in the state at the time, that we'd already been through this scenario with the Granholm administration, our energy <laughs> secretary yes. now, did the same thing. And and you guys showed how ineffective and, and really, you know, how that just squandered boatloads of taxpayer money. Yeah. I mean, one of the lessons that you get from um, uh, that I, I wish states would learn, but I don't know that they're ever going to, which is <laughs> I swear. Uh, if, well, so if these are, I'll mention one <laughs> to you in a minute, but go ahead. Yeah. It, if if you are going to have a jobs program, it needs to be tied to jobs. What the battery subsidy programs uh, were doing was subsidizing specific outputs of manufacturing products, and a lot of these factories did it. They tapped in on, on that. They got uh, their taxpayer subsidies, but they didn't meet the job performance uh, 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 that they expected. So we lost a ton of money. It didn't do the thing that lawmakers wanted it to do. So yeah, like you you shouldn't hand out payments to companies for jobs until they actually create the jobs because that's hard. Mm -hmm. Like, um, or if you look, do claw it back when they don't deliver. The well, payments. well, so the, most of these things do have clawback requirements. Um, uh, if, if you don't do it, but, uh, you know, a lot of times it's okay. You gave money to this plant. The plant didn't work. They cashed in on, uh, on uh, they cashed in on some state subsidies. Then they just uh, then they eliminated jobs, but there's no one left now to pay you back your money. Um, and then sometimes it's just they. Uh, oh, actually, a lot of times it is the company didn't live up to expectations, but there are still jobs there. So let's just let them keep uh, keep what they got because we don't want to be mean to uh, to job providers. Yeah. And there's a lot of uh, shifting the uh, the goalposts on, on that too. Yep. But one of the lessons that lawmakers should get, if you're going to in, be engaged in this process, and I don't think you should be, but um, what happens is like companies rarely meet their expectations. So for the state's Michigan Economic Growth Authority program, which ran from 1995 to 2012, uh, we looked at like, all right, here's what they said, here's what they did. And only 2.3% of recipients lived up to their job creation oh, yeah. uh, announcements. So just 2.3%. Wow. Uh, like that's, again, like it's, it's, it's a little more than one out of 50. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
and so it's like, well, if, if this is going to be the case that like you don't live up to what's in your press release, you should make sure that money doesn't change hands until you actually start creating jobs. Yep. Um, that's a lesson that our lawmakers have not learned. Like this new SOAR program writes huge checks over the short term. Companies get to collect a lot of money before they ever employ uh, someone. And if they fail to meet job creation targets, maybe after 10 years, the state can ask for some of its money back. Maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, it's just terrible structure for it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the better call is, is, is the same thing that, that, that you would expect, uh, that you would, yeah, you'd expect. And I think people both on the right and the left also want this, which is better business climate, quality of life issues. Yep. These are things that states have powerful influences over. Uh, it doesn't necessarily get you a photo op at the next groundbreaking ceremony, mm -hmm. but they're important things that matter to state economic growth. And we can honestly see this by the states that are growing in this post-pandemic recovery. It's yep. not the states that are handing out the biggest checks to the biggest firms. It's Utah. It's Idaho. Uh, by the way, Utah and Idaho, underappreciated, just fast-growing states right now. Yep. Um, uh, but the big ones that get a lot more attention are Texas and Florida. Um, sure. Texas does some, uh, they do some subsidy, uh, uh, subsidization too. I don't think they're effective. Um, there's a jobs or there's a deal closing fund that I'm especially skeptical of, but it's not especially active. Florida, on the other hand, is getting rid of its selective subsidy programs. That's a good thing. And it's one of these yep. fast growing states. Uh, what matters to your state's economic future is not whether you hand out big checks to big companies. And I wish our lawmakers would recognize that. Yeah. Well, one I've had my eye on, and I actually interviewed Governor Greg Gianforte from Montana. Yeah, uh, I saw that. Shows ago. Mm -hmm. And they're doing exactly that, you know, where they're tackling things to make their state appealing to manufacturers. And it's new for them. You know, they weren't yeah. known as a manufacturing state, um, yeah. but it's something they're going after. And they're going after the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. So they're making their tax policies more sensible for business. They're creating job training programs for the people who are going to need skilled trades and, and uh, factory workers and housing, tackling the housing challenge, you know, going after those yeah, things I know that are the, the core needs of the manufacturers to come and build, then invest their own money. Yeah. And as I understand it though, like they're doing some really interesting stuff on housing and zoning policy in Montana yeah. to allow for more housing and different types of housing because right. like a lot of a lot of the, the issue on, on housing is like you could build housing but it's got to be in greenfields and look exactly yeah. like this and um and it, it i mean it's a very regulated field right. and a lot of these things just increase the costs and decrease your ability to act uh, to build the types of housing that a lot of people want yeah and then a lot of people yeah. could afford yep yeah and so i just i'm going to keep watching those guys because you know my question for you on looking at you know the political sound bites that you talked about in the in the the uh photo op doing the groundbreaking how do states compete then when you've got a gretchen whitmer out there doling out huge dollops of cash to these big companies and getting all the pub publicity how do states like montana continue to Say, you know what? Yeah, it's very splashy over there in Michigan, but come look at us. Yeah. I mean, I do wish that our states and our state lawmakers would be thumping their chest about their economic performance, like actual economic performance, yeah. rather than things that just seem like they're evidence of job growth. Like we spend yeah. a lot of good taxpayer money on our um on our Bureau of Labor Statistics, our Bureau of Economic Analysis to try and find out you know, what, what, what is going on in the economy? What are right. the trends? Like how, how are states performing? And unfortunately, too many people seem to be distracted by instances of economic growth. And let me share something that I think is, is really underappreciated. Uh, because I, I do think like, if you, if you get a handle on this, uh, on this stat, you'll see that like these job announcements that that our lawmakers are so proud of that promote so much and that they have to offer like take money from everyone and give to 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 a single firm mm -hmm. um you know that they think that this is necessary it's just not the scope necessary to improve um 
improve a state's actual economic performance. And that is this underappreciated amount of job creation and job loss that goes on in the economy every every year, every every month. So uh, it's it's I think um, about one. I'm oh, sorry. It's uh, about five percent every quarter, which is massive. So in the state of Michigan, it's we create and lose over eight hundred thousand jobs every year, like mm -hmm. create and lose, and that's out of an out of an employment base of uh, of a little over four million. Mm -hmm. Like it's a massive amount of turnover that goes yeah, on. The yeah. economy moves so fast. People and, are and that's finding just, that's just the normal churn in the economy. Yeah, just the normal churn in the economy of people finding new employment opportunities and people losing uh, losing their jobs. And, uh, and and by the way, that's also a little bit undercounted because the way that they calculate this is to look at like, all right, individual office A, at the end of this quarter, how many jobs did you have? It's like, well, uh, well, we've got we, we've got five. It's like, well, last quarter you had one, so um, uh, so you added one job that, and then we just calculate all that. It's like, well, right. that office could have had a five person turnover. Uh, right. You know, pe five people could have gotten employed, and five people could have lost, uh, and and it only show up as one. But still, still, uh, even with all that, like eight hundred thousand jobs a year for these job announcements, even these big ones, mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, that, that get all these headlines, you're talking about a thousand yeah. jobs, 2000 yeah. jobs there. I mean, em, uh, employment facilities don't get much bigger than that these days. Um, like it's, it's just not at the scope that's necessary to affect the state's economic performance. What does are things that matter to a lot of businesses. So uh, uh, policies that, uh, I mean, obviously your tax policy, every business is going to pay taxes. Every uh, person is, is subject uh, to income taxes. Like that's a powerful policy that touches a lot of people and, and is a discouragement to employment, to investment. Yeah. Uh, other things that states can do that matter a lot, like uh, uh, every uh, utility company is subject to state regulation. And uh, well, if you don't have good regulation of your utilities, you will, like Michigan, have unreliable electricity at higher than average rates. Yeah. That's a bad thing. This is a this yeah. also affects every business. And if we do that, if we do uh, uh, electricity regulation better, we can have more reliable energy at lower prices. Uh, so uh, those are some of the things that we cover I, again, like I want to plug our work on occupational licensing, especially now that I think it's like tw uh, almost 20% of the workforce, uh, required uh, like ha is subject to one of these occupational licensing requirements. Yeah. Like it, it matters to a lot. Of, it matters to a lot of people. And that's what lawmakers should be looking at when they're trying to grow the economy of like, what are some of the rules that we can change? to you know, secure Im important uh, public things. Like I'm not arguing to get rid of all, the, all of the, the taxes, but I do think that uh, most states can afford, uh, uh, can afford to, to reduce some of their taxes too, right. especially after this pandemic where state revenues just exploded. Mm -hmm. but, um, um, but can review your occupational licensing rules, can review your environment or your electrical regulation, and then do all sorts of public services better, more effective and, uh, 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 yeah, yeah, better and more effective and, and for lower costs. Like those are all really important things that we can, that we can talk about that, that can actually help, uh, move your economy ahead. And when you look at the states that are doing well, they tend to be the states that are doing those things. Right. Right. Well, and back to your point about taxes, you know, it's what people kind of miss uh, there in the connection is if you're doling out these huge dollops of taxpayer money, that's mm -hmm. coming out of people's pockets, right? So, that, yes, that especially that on the state and lower the burden for everybody. Yeah, especially and and again, like with um, so again, like I'm in, I'm in the state of Michigan. We do a lot of of subsidizing businesses in the state of Michigan. I keep a scorecard uh, for our lawmakers about how many business subsidies they authorize and how many they vote against. So each mm -hmm. lawmaker has a record for it, going back to 2001. Yep. Uh, this year, or sorry, last year, lawmakers approved $4.3 billion of business subsidies. Like that's, wow. that's a huge amount uh, of, of, of transfers. Like that's, um, oh, let's see. As, as just a comparison, we could 
probably cut the income tax by a third. And that's the state's largest tax for all that uh, money. That, I mean, for just a year, of course, but but it's a it's a massive part of that. I mean, that's more than we spend on on state universities. It's more mm -hmm. than we oh, sorry, it's more than we spend on state the, the taxpayers spend on state universities and prisons combined. Like it's wow. a massive amount of money. Let's uh, uh, and 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 those other institutions provide important benefits to the public. I don't think that our economic development programs that are not required to develop the economy are doing the, uh, are providing important public services. Yeah. Yeah. The basics. Yeah. All excellent points. And, uh, you know, I'm doing my part to help get that word out there. So um, what's next for you? What, what, what's, what are you focusing on for yourself? What is the Mackinac center focusing on? Oh, we've got a lot of irons in the fire right now. Um, but I, I wanted to point out just uh, two things. Um, uh, Governor Whitmer does seem to be very interested in handing out more business subsidies, and we're going to try and speak truth to power on that issue uh, because there there are. I mean, we didn't talk a lot about the reasons why states subsidize select businesses, but a lot of it is just because. I mean, as, as a general rule, someone comes up to state lawmakers and says, "Please give me special favors," and our and our lawmakers say, "Yes, that sounds like a good idea." I mean, that that's basically like we offer these things because someone asks for it. Yeah. Um, our, our lawmakers, just despite what they might tell you, are not that creative, but a lot of lobbyists are. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, um, uh, so we're going to ha be having that fight. We was just testifying earlier this week about uh, film subsidies that our lawmakers were considering. Mm -hmm. And yep. um, but one thing I think I'm, I'm going to try and uh, that I, I think people should know about is that when we're having these debates about how much to offer in selective business subsidies, one of the points that our lawmakers will make is that we need to do this because other states offer uh, uh, subsidies too. And we need yeah. to compete with them. Yep. Well, you actually don't need to compete with them, uh, in fact, uh, uh, because they don't work. But right. if you do think that it's necessary, that if you're only doing this because other states are, well, that's kind of a race to the bottom. But mm -hmm. but there's a better way of doing that, which is mm -hmm. okay. Fine, add 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 a subsidy to compete with other states, but you should try to work with other states to disarm yourselves of these programs. Yeah. So yeah. I have uh, I'm working with a coalition of people to introduce a state compact where uh, to get states to disarm themselves of their selective subsidy programs. Uh, so states can states can agree with each other to say this is not how we want to be competing with e uh, with each other. We'll end our programs if you end yours. Yeah. And I would love, I would love to see more candidates running on this issue. And so what I'm going to do is try and uh, try and pitch some people, um, uh, 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 pitch some people that that subject to endorse this interstate compact to eliminate corporate welfare. Excellent. Yeah. I'm all for it. <laughs> yeah, me well, too. excellent. James. <laughs> Anything to share with the, uh, the audience here before we wrap up? Well, I guess I should, uh, if there's a takeaway for, uh, um, uh, for your audience, um, it's that, uh, our law, there is a perennial demand from our lawmakers to do something about jobs and way too many of them interpret that mandate as being, oh, I need to offer select subsidies to the next business that comes around. And uh, what I want everyone, uh, like, I think there's a good case to be made against that, but I would want people, uh, I just want them to be more skeptical whenever they see uh, a politician issuing a press release that they created a lot of jobs. What I would want them to understand is like, well, they're using my money to do that often, not always, often. Um, sometimes it really is about lowering a business tax burdens to not hand writing them a big check, right. but, uh, yeah. but I, I want them to know that when they, when they do that, it's, it, they're, they're doing it with your money and that what they're doing is ineffective at creating jobs, unfair to the businesses who don't, uh, get preferred treatment and expensive to, uh, to the state government. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, the other thing to me that occurred uh, in my mind, as you were talking about that is watch the other side of the coin. You know, we've been mm -hmm. hemorrhaging jobs at the same time. Um, the layoffs with the automakers, you know, some manufacturers shutting down that goes to those fundamentals that we haven't been taken care of. And there's a lot of reasons for those things, but, you know, being a high tech state and a high regulation state that makes it mm -hmm. tough for, for other manufacturers to compete. And you want, 
your existing manufacturers to stay here before you start thinking about bringing others in, right? Yeah. And don't forget labor strife as well. Um, I think sure. another yeah. important thing that lawmakers uh, should do is to make sure that uh, private sector mem- uh, private sector people who are covered by collective bargaining agreements can opt out of union membership. It's right to work law. I think that's important to try and get unions to be uh, to come into the 21st century so they can be a positive influence for both their members and uh, and for uh, for companies too. And we just don't have that right now. We have antagonistic. Yeah. Uh, antag- union policies based on an antagonistic relationship, which yep. uh, which I don't think is good for job growth, uh, for, uh, for one. And I don't think it's especially good for um, uh, uh, for the states that have uh, that have a lot of unions that are constantly at war with their employers. Right. Yeah. It's not good for the rank and file either. Yeah. Yep. Excellent point, James. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate thank- all your insights. Thank you for having me on, Jim. All right. Well, we'll have to do this again sometime as you move forward and work on tackling all those other subsidies. And of course, thanks to all of you out there. You're the reason we're here. Thanks for joining us today. We're here at least once a week. Now here lately, it's even been twice a week. Definitely every Tuesday. Look for another show potentially on Thursdays. Um, So yeah, tune in. We've got more stories. I mean, James brought some excellent education today. I can't promise they're all going to be as educational as what James Homan brought to us today from the Mackinac Center for Public Policy, but they're all going to be educational. So thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in to Manufacturing Talks with Jim Vinosky. Watch for new episodes dropping every Tuesday. Don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe.